Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to members and officers. This is a joint uh, select committee, um, adults and children and young people today, because we're having a look at the area plan, and we've also got a dementia-friendly workshop, which is open to all members after the first item of this meeting. Um, so I'd like to sort of firstly elect a chair and a vice chair for today's meeting. Can I have nominations, please, for a chair? So, Councillor Harris is nominated Councillor Howard, seconded by Councillor Thomas, okay. Um, can we have a nomination for a vice chair? Louise Brown. Councillor Brown, can we have a seconder? Second that. Councillor Lane, okay. So, Councillor Harris is just coming to take his seat. If we could possibly do some introductions, please, because we've got some, some new faces with us today. Councillor Howarth. Hi, good morning everyone and welcome to our special meeting. Um, I'm Councillor Simon Howarth, I chair Adult Select and I represent Gilwyn, Cliddock and Lynethley Hill. Um, Hazel Eilert, Scrutiny. Paula Harris, Democratic Services. Claire Marchant, Chief Officer, Social Care and Health. Phil Diamond, Regional Partnership Team. Mike Fowler, Parent Governor Representative. Maureen Powell, County Councillor for Castle Ward and Abergavenny, and a member of the Children Young People's Committee. Judah Thomas, Go. sorry, Councillor for Priory and member of CYP. Councillor Roger Harris, uh, member for Crisona Ward in uh, Abergavenny, and member of Adult Select Committee. Morning, Sheila Woodhouse, member for Growfield Ward in Abergavenny, and member of both committees. Good morning, uh, Councillor Trahan for Overmorrow, member of the PSB Select Committee. Thank you. Good morning, Councillor Reverend Malcolm Lane, uh, Councillor for the Mardi, uh, member of the CNYP Committee. Thank you. Good morning, Councillor Louise Brown, member for Shire Newton Ward, and also a member of both committees and Vice Chair of Adults. Thank you. Councillor Val Smith, observing. Right. Maureen, have we done you? Yes. Have we? Right, no problem. Yeah. Claire, have we done you? <laughs> have we? Well, there you go. I've disappeared somewhere. I was totally, totally, I'm just trying to find my agenda. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Thanks for coming this morning. Um, can we start off? We do have a presentation um, with us, and uh, we'll get into that straight away. Is that all right? You ready to go? Yes, Is members happy with that? Yep. Yes. Yep. You won't be too long, will you? Not too long at all, no. <laughs> music I, I music to my ears. I see some f fancy books in front of you there, some pamphlets y or yes. whatever. Well, what are they? Right, well, actually, that's a good place to start. It right. Was a, it was about a year ago that uh, I came to full council uh, to present the report to sign off the population needs assessment, which is this document. And at that meeting, uh, I sort of made the offer to return back to you to um, present the area plan. At the time, the population needs assessment set out the sort of need for the region, uh, but it was very much those high-level priorities. Those priorities have now got to be turned into an, actions, an, into an action plan, and uh, that's where we are today. However, uh, I know that um, the area plan has gone to full council and has been discussed there, so some of this will be a lot um, familiar to you. However, just to reiterate that uh, in the one sense, it was, this was the easy part, putting words on the paper, Actually, the area plan was the easy part, putting words, actions on the paper. The hard part starts the 1st of April, because now we have to turn those words into action. And we have a number of strategic uh, partnerships across the region, uh, which will turn the sort of priorities in the needs assessment, but which have found their way into the area plan, into real action. And uh, we have to um, report on that to Welsh Government uh, every year as well. So there'll still be an opportunity. So even though the plan has been to full council and you may have had comments, uh, any views that you have will, can still be considered and will be vitally important going forward because we now have to take this through the strategic delivery groups. Okay, okay any questions on that? No? Okay. Right. Well, away you go. Okay. 
Uh, just a quick reminder to everybody, the publisher needs assessment is based on eight statutory core themes identified by Welsh Government. You can see them on the screen, uh, but it's quite a varied agenda from children to older people to carers to mental health. And uh, the PNA set out need against those eight uh, themes, and the area plan uh, sets out an action, uh, sub-action plan for each of those core themes. Uh, you know, Welsh Government has set in place some um, statutory requirements. Uh, this area plan has to follow the same cycle as the electoral cycle down in, in uh, Welsh Government. Uh, it has to focus on integration. Um, part 9 of the Act stipulates that we have to integrate services for children with complex needs, for older people with dementia. And helpfully, helpfully, Welsh Government haven't given us a definition of what integration means. So we have to make, uh, you know, we have to use our own definition, which gives us a bit of flexibility. Uh, within the plan, we have to set up the pool budgets arrangement, and again, another statutory requirement around the pool budgets for care homes. Uh, we also have to set up uh, how we will take forward early intervention, preventative services. Again, there's no set definition of what prevention is, um, and we will look to regional partners to get our own sort of arrive at our own de definition. Sets out information, advice, and assistance, and also uh, links into the performance management framework. So actually. When you put the area plan together and you meet all the requirements of Welsh Government, there's probably not a lot else to do, really. But, um, you know, this plan is not uh, viewed in isolation. Uh, the um, area plan will link very closely to the Wellbeing Plan under the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. And what you have uh, on the screen is just the definitions of um, well-being under the uh, Social Services and Wellbeing Act. Uh, on the left and on the right you have the well-being goals and the, you know they're very similar uh, in nature however when you actually lay down the principles of both acts side by side social services well-being and the well-being of future gens they're almost identical they're both predicated on pr prevention partnership collaboration uh, co-production involvement of people one plan in terms of well-being of future generations is obviously looking at the population over a, you know, a long period. Uh, the Social Services and Wellbeing Act is looking at well-being of uh, specific health and social care needs. But when you include early intervention and prevention in that, it's still a wider population. Okay, just some very bit of quick uh, is context. You know, this plan will set up new ways of working in the same way as the well-being plan. And uh, I presented this the last time I was here, and you're, you're very familiar with it. It's the financial uh, sort of outlook for the London Borough of Barnet, often referred to the um, graph of doom. But what that is showing is that when the blue line meets the uh, block graph in 2022, that the whole of a local authority budget in the uh, London Borough of Barnet could be t um, given over to social care. So, you know, we have to look at new ways of working and working differently, because if we carry on doing the same, we get the, we get the same. Uh, the next graph is the population. Uh, what that is showing is that over the next 10 years, we are going to see an increase in the number of older people over the age of 65 in relation to the number of younger people and the, uh, up to the age of 15, the, the blue line. Okay, uh, going forward, this area plan will um, be scrutinised and will be the responsibility of the Regional Partnership Board, uh, which has been uh, developed over uh, through the Act, and also that this plan is a statutory duty on the five authorities and the Health Board. And I think where this plan is different, in the past there would have been good relationships between directors and the health board on a number of different uh, programmes, whether it's frailty and some real good examples which Gwent is renowned for. However, there was always that opportunity um, for a partner, for a local authority, for the health board to maybe jump off at a certain point uh, because it was all through the goodwill. The uh, way this plan is different is set in stone. It's a statutory requirement uh, and uh, it will be reported on to Welsh Government. So it's a little bit more of a bind, bind in between the local authorities. Uh, so actually there's not a huge amount of new priorities in there you know we'd be surprised if there was but uh, you know it is formalizing for me the arrangement between the local authorities and the health board around that health and social care agenda okay what i'm going to do over the next few slides is is skim across the surface of the priorities and um, what i would like to do is to get to the end of the powerpoint 
and then maybe um, give you an opportunity to focus on, on any key areas. Instead of me going through each slide, um, you may have a focus on children's, adults, or uh, um, autism. So if I give a whistle-stop tour, and then uh, maybe we can come back and uh, tackle some of the priorities. Yeah. Okay, so the first uh, priority, children, young people, the, you know, the real out big outcome for us year was around children with complex needs, especially children looked after children placed out of the county. And uh, Claire is the chair of the Children and Families Board. We meet this afternoon and uh, the urgency amongst the group and the way we will be um, concentrating efforts is to look at those looked after children who placed out of the county, but all right at that crisis point of um, maybe being taken into care and looking what we can be doing at an earlier opportunity. So that's a big focus for the group, but also the work around the Adverse Childhood Experience Agenda as well, and looking at what we can be doing uh, regionally there. Around older people, loneliness and isolation came up as a large priority, as did uh, dementia and uh, housing. So what, uh, the high-level actions in the blue box, you know, we're very much looking at the dementia-friendly community agenda, which, and obviously we've got the Dementia Friends uh, session following. In terms of health and physical disabilities, there was a, a real sort of um, push to, you know, that sort of community um, sort of resource, what we can be doing at earlier opportunity to, for us to look after ourselves, but within the community as well. So there's the care close at home strategy, um, which has come from the health board, but also looking at linking with the PSBs around the um, wellbeing plan as well. So that's an obvious area that, you know, we would work together. Sensory impairment. You know, when I when I met people with um, uh, sensory impairment, they were telling me it was often the information and advice which was helpful. And you know, if they'd had the information at the new opportunity, you know, they could have made um, plans, they could have made arrangements, uh, etc. But also the emotional well-being that comes with people maybe losing senses, whether it's um, uh, uh, eyesight or hearing, etc. And um, there was a, a story shared with me where they, um, a lady was losing her sight and was becoming very um, depressed uh, but um, what she found was really helpful was speaking to another person who had maybe gone through it and was able to tell her yes this is you know very difficult challenge however this will help and and that was and she, and the comment was I feel a lot better now about my condition because I've spoke to someone who can understand what I've gone through and they've also given me some good advice um, in terms of mental health, it's very much about the emotional well-being, the stigma, and it's about how we uh, work with our schools to improve emotional well-being within schools, but also uh, within the adult agenda, it's looking at that crisis point as well, and whether the resources are there for those people that are right at the crisis of the mental health agenda, but also how we increase our own emotional well-being. We all know that what's good for us in terms of what we eat and exercise, but we need to have that same approach with our um, emotional well-being as well. Learning disabilities is a new strategy that's been developed across the region and that's very much setting out um, 10 objectives uh, where the local authorities and the health board will come together. The, uh, the, the group met yesterday and what came out very strongly was employment opportunities and, and independent living for people with live, learning disabilities to have a fulfilled life as possible. And uh, also what comes under that agenda is the um, autism agenda and there's, there's a new regional service uh, here in Gwent, um, commissioned through Welsh Government funds uh, to look at improving autism uh, in terms of the diagnosis and the resources and the early intervention at that point of diagnosis. And then the big one obviously is carers, you, you know, where would we be without carers if, if every carer uh, in Monmouthshire, in Gwent actually uh, sort of woke up this morning and said, I'm not caring. You, you know, there would be no public services. So it's about the huge support that um, carers offer, recognising that, and also looking at what we can do in terms of support. Uh, respite will always come up as an issue, um, as will our access to information. And uh, there's a carers board, they meet on Friday. Uh, we have carers around the table, and it's looking at how we take that forward um, around, you know, also work with young carers. But uh, there's a num they've identified a number of actions. And it also is worth mentioning that I haven't gone away into a darkened room and come up with these high level actions myself. Each one of those strategic partnerships have identified the next steps. So in terms of the carers board, what you see in front of you has come from that um, carers board. So whether it's about medical prompting to support carers right through to information around things like DEWIS, um, but also the care close at home agenda. Okay, and, and I guess for me, really, just to finish, the, the, 
I've mentioned so many different core themes. There's so many different uh, pieces of work going ahead. You have the adult agenda, children agenda, and it can feel like a huge jigsaw puzzle, trying to piece everything together. How does Families First fit with flying start and supporting people? How does the adult agenda fit with the um, children's agenda around transition? How does the regeneration agenda support the learning disabilities agenda with employment? It's all jigsaw pieces. What the area plan has given us um, is that framework, is those edge pieces. And we, we know that obviously when we, do a when we um, put a puzzle together, it's those edge pieces we get in place first. Because once you've got the edge pieces, it's easier to make the connections. And I'm, th th that's my view, really, that this area plan is setting those edge pieces of the puzzle, which is going to make it easier for learning disabilities to link with the carers, to link with the mental health agenda, for the children's agenda to link in mental health carers, etc. And uh, at that point, I'm happy to finish and take any questions, or if anybody would like to focus in on any specific yeah. area. I think we have quite a bit there. Right, I've got Maureen signaling to start. Maureen? Thank you, Chairman. What I've noticed over the years, and I think, I'm not sure how old Val is, but I think I'm probably one of the oldest, I am probably the oldest in the room here, is that over the years, where you've got people um, that have lived in their own home on their own, and then it's starting to come that they can't manage. You take them out of their other home, put them into other accommodations, and if they've got a slight dementia, it increases. Mm -hmm. And if it's at all possible to keep them within their own home, and there's enough care that can cover that, that won't happen. And I've seen it in many, many times where that has happened. I think that's a, a really important point, and that's why when um, Phil talked about that respite priority, uh, it's not respite as we have traditionally provided it, because traditionally, and there's still some element of it, which is still important for some people, we take people out of their own homes into a facility, so the carer has respite, um, but for the person themselves who um, is in a very different environment, it can take weeks, months for them to get reorientated when they go back home after that period of respite. So we're looking at far more flexible options around respite, such as direct payments, which enable people to um, purchase care to come into their own home. So they, the carer still gets their respite, but the care is provided in, in that person's home. Um, expansion of the um, shared life scheme to pick up um, carers who will care for people with dementia, again, looking at how that can be provided in the home, um, making sure that there's flexible respite provided across the week, and it's not just that sort of traditional six-week block. So exactly the, those those issues you, you highlighted, Councillor Powell. Also, it, it really reinforces the importance of all the services that we've got to prevent admission to hospital, because similarly, somebody can go into hospital with a physical ailment. Um, the dementia goes like that doesn't it because of again being out of their usual environment so so it's really important all those community services are really well developed to, to prevent admission if at all possible okay Maureen you happy yes, thank you. all right thank you Roger thank you uh, chair uh, I'm not sure if you two out there are the ones that should be answering these questions but I'll ask them in in, in any case who th this is uh, a plan across five local authorities. Um, you know, there used to be one local authority and it sums up the craziness of the situation. But uh, who is, where does the buck stop? Who is the overall person in charge? I'll ask the other ones first of all, then you can. Um. Secondly, as I've mentioned already, there's five authorities um, that have got their own bits of the uh, plan. Is there an overall budget controlled by this person where the buck stops or is it down to each individual authority to put their own bits in? And if that is the case, what happens if one of them or two of them or three of them fail to the overall uh, plan? And, and thirdly, have we got the staff? Um, uh, it's a tremendously adventurous plan and we all hope it it works, but are there enough staff in all these authorities in the relevant positions to make sure it does work? And finally, please, and I've 
I'll ask again. There's about 500 million acronyms in here that keep bouncing around all over the place. Please, can we have a list so that we can, instead of going back to page 98 where we saw it last time, or we thought we did, a single page where there we can go to that and it will save us an awful lot of time and make us more interested in the report. Thank you. I'll, I'll pick up... I'll, I'll pick up probably the first three. I'll leave the last one to, to fill. But I think the first ones around accountability are critically important. Um, accountability for social care and health services in Monmouthshire um, sits with us here as Monmouthshire County Council. We are required statutorily um, under the Social Services and Wellbeing Act um, to be one of the statutory partners to Regional Partnership Board um, and the Regional Partnership Board through membership of our Cabinet member Councillor Penny Jones um, oversees a lot of work and, and is required to do a lot of work again through statute by Welsh Government but the buck stops here with us in Monmouthshire um, and with you as, as councillors in Monmouthshire in and, with me, and, and with me as statutory director here in Monmouthshire, so it's my fault as well, um, in terms of social care services um, for our county. We are required to work, work regionally, and it makes sense also to work regionally on, on a lot of these big strategic health and social care issues because as some of those, those issues such as looked after children and out of county placements, we are too small as an individual authority to solve those, those problems on our own. We need to work regionally with our partners um, to put in place creative solutions um, which have got some economy of scale and which we bring resources together to, to solve some of, of those problems. Other things like our wellbeing approaches, we can work to common models across um, the region but delivery really has to, to be local and reflect the, the, the strength of, of individual communities. On that budget question, um, it was interesting um, I suppose going back to Council on Tuesday again, the paper that came forward around the pooled budget for care homes, because at the moment, um, that pooled fund is very much a non-risk sharing pooled fund, and the money that we put in for Monmouthshire is the money we get out for Monmouthshire. If we overspend as Monmouthshire um, and place more people in care homes than our budget, that risk sits with us. That's the same model that we have for frailty. Um, so it's a section 33, we work to a common model but Monmouthshire money is spent on, on Monmouthshire people. Will that change over time? Will there be new regulations coming through that require that to change? That's something which is the subject of, of lots of, of discussion through the WLGA and Welsh Government at the moment. Um, but, you know, we, again, this is why it's responsibility of council have, have that responsibility in terms of resourcing services for our people but working and discharging those, those accountabilities and responsibilities across the region. The workforce question is really interesting at every level. Um, I know Adult Select had the presentation um, on the work that we've been doing around domiciliary care, turning the world upside down. Um, one of the critical drivers in that, that work um, is the fact that we have increasing need in our ageing population. Um, for the ageing population who don't have needs for domiciliary care, they're often not economically active and we have a reducing demographic in terms of people who are um, in that employment age and we need to make sure that domiciliary care is attractive enough to those people as a career um, and that we're not losing people to the developments of new supermarkets and other things. So a workforce plan recognising all of that is absolutely vital. Again, we're looking to do some of that, what we can on a regional basis, but recognising the specific issues here in Monmouthshire about our demographic um, and our employment um, and economic position, which makes recruiting into domiciliary care even more challenging than, than some of our neighbouring authorities. There are also workforce challenges at every level. A number of years ago, I may have been here as director for Monmouthshire, delivering what I needed to through Monmouthshire partnerships. Now myself and all my colleagues are, are both working in, in Monmouthshire, working in regional groups, having to chair those groups and, and deliver pieces of work. So, so the regional dimension does place additional capacity demands really at, at every level and we've got to make sure that those um, regional partnerships are op operating effectively. But workforce is, is critical to delivery both operationally and, and strategically. I don't know if you want to pick Can up the I afternoon. Just step in there now? Roger and as committees, are we clear now on that first one? Because we weren't before, and I'm a little bit clearer now. The answer is, this plan mm. is ours, mm. nobody else's. 
and we will only be scrutinising ours. So where we talk about the regional side, and I think what's happened here is we got confused where we've got Torvine and Newport and Caffili. We're not combined in the plan. They may, they may have the same objectives. How they deliver them objectives is going to be totally different to us, yeah? We will measure solely ours, correct? I, I, I think, I think it's a little more nuanced than this. If we use frailty as an example, because there's a lot of experience here in you know, other Gwent authorities um, through the frailty, Section 33, joint governance around a range of services, we are held to account, if you like, as a council through organisations such as Wales Audit Office and others for our performance as Monmouthshire. We discharge that through governance arrangements which we have constructed with our partners, which need to be effective, but which need to be regularly scrutinised here in Monmouthshire. And what you would be scrutinising is the performance of Monmouthshire officers in delivery of those arrangements, which relate to our statutory duties, but we're delivering them via regional um, working. Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, um, well, yeah. yeah it, 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 it does. It, it does, but we're, we're talking about a, a plan for five authorities mm. here, and, um, you know, if, if some of them fail, how does that affect us? In other words, if we're sailing through quite nice and, uh, uh, and, and happily and others are falling apart, the overall plan is pretty pointless, isn't it, really, because it's failing uh, a, a population. We're, we're, we're doing all right, and if we are doing all right, why aren't they uh, 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 doing all right? Mm. And just coming back to what you're saying, the buck stops with us county councillors, but if I've got a problem on my ward, I want to go and talk to somebody, and, and it's you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, yeah. That's, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Everybody clear, because we weren't at the start, were we? None of us were clear exactly where the link up was with the other authorities. But we are clear this plan is what the other authorities have as well. Mm -hmm. Clear objectives are the same. How we deliver that is up to us in Monmouthshire. We don't deliver new ports unless, no. unless it's cross cutting. No. Correct? Well. Yeah, but, but we will have a range of strategies which increasingly we will see things which go through all five authorities and the health board. Um, so we will all, Care, Care Closer to Home is, is an interesting one. You saw it mentioned a couple of times um, on Phil's slides. We've not brought that formally here in Monmouthshire because we've already been working in a very integrated way for, for many, many years um, around neighbourhood care networks with, with primary care and others. And it wasn't a new thing for us in terms of a policy direction. Other authorities have taken that through for formal endorsement um, as a policy or, or certainly for, for scrutiny as a policy so we're all agreeing a common strategic approach but we're all delivering it and being held to account locally for for delivery against that you know we, we, the more things where we can have common strategies across the region the better really increasingly we will see joint services across you know, there already are some joint services things like shared lives we commission collectively um, as authorities across this region and with Merthyr as well. But if you were wanting to hold somebody to account for the delivery of that shared live scheme, you wouldn't be holding to account Caffili who host it. You'd be holding myself and Julie Boothroyd as, as head of adult services to account for how that impacts on Monmouthshire residents. Okay. Finally, coming Stay back on, there, on, yeah. on, on that, we, we, we know we come and, and uh, talk to you. Uh, presumably, um, there'll be a, a, an annual... Uh, report, but yeah. presumably you and the other four people in your uh, position will be getting together on a, on a regular basis, seeing where things are really going well and seeing where things aren't going so well. So it'll be that's where the communal support presumably uh, comes in. At least I hope that's the, uh, the case. So there will, will be regular meetings. Oh, there's, there's very regular meetings. And I think in, in picking up your point, Councillor Harris, about you know, we might be doing well on some th something, another authority might not, and there'll be vice versa as well of that. So there's really good practice right across the region. Have we got universally excellent practice on everything across the five? No. That's what the plan and the strategic partnerships which sit beneath the, the board aim to get us to, because you should have the same quality of outcomes. Some of the nuances around delivery are different in Monmouthshire to some of the other areas because of the rurality, because of the nature of our communities. It would be different in Blyne Gwent from the centre of Newport equally, mm -hmm. wouldn't it? Um, so, so those are, you know, 
I guess, the practical issues in terms of delivering a, against a common vision, set of strategies and, and outcomes. Just okay. Very, very quickly, yeah. just just uh, support that. I was, uh, you know, Claire mentioned uh, sharing a good practice, and I think that's exactly uh, you know what the plan is there to do is to identify where things are working well. But also, you know, the plan is is in one sense a, a vision as well. Dementia friendly communities is a vision for Gwent to have a dementia friendly communities. Each local authority will have an individual dementia-friendly community action plan. So what you focus here in Monmouthshire may be different to Newport. So you will have that flexibility. You might want to have a big focus on schools or maybe um, doing some work with um, shops in Abergavenny or Anask, etc. You go to Newport, it might be transport. You go to Caerphilly, it might be the local authority. Uh, you go somewhere else, it might be hospitals. So yes, think it, the plan is that kind of vision, but there's still enough flexibility in there for local authorities to have the sort of uh, their own voice and ensure their own direction underneath that vision. Okay, thank you. Right, I've got Councillor Woodhouse, Councillor Thomas, and Councillor Brown. Councillor Woodhouse, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Harris's question it was exactly the what I was trying to um, work out. I want to understand how the all the, the the five authorities are going to be working together and. I know you've explained that very well with regard to best practice and, and shared responsibilities. In fact, you look outside these authorities for um, um, collaboration. I, I do understand that. So you've answered that. Uh, my question now is about letting all our councillors know outside of select committees how we, go, how we can go ahead and uh, encourage all our councillors to, mo to monitor this along with us, not just the select committees. I think that's an important point. The, the one thing I probably missed out from the previous answer is, is around the Regional Partnership Board. I, I think I, I probably have mentioned it, but it's just important to note that that is also on a statutory basis. Um, so that, that board, which Councillor Jones is the member of for us, um, is set out in Part 9 of the Social Services and Wellbeing Act and has specific responsibilities. In terms of that monitoring, um, the Regional Partnership Board produces an annual report. I think it's important that we think about where that goes and not just mm -hmm. through select committees, but up into, um, up into cabinet and into to council potentially as well, because in terms of discharging our accountabilities and the responsibilities vested in statute in that board, which include oversight and delivery of this area plan, which is so critically important, um, is, is considerable, isn't it? So, it, so it, it's really important that the whole council and understand that context. Increasingly also Welsh Government channel resource through um, decision making um, at that regional partnership board. So one of the things which the area plan will incorporate, because it's very much an iterative document, will be around integrated care fund investment. Now when Welsh Government put out the guidance and requirement around that funding, it's not a grant, it's money which comes into the health board. The health board are required for the plans and the services delivered through that fund to be um, approved and endorsed by um, the Regional Partnership Board, and it's interesting because Wales Audit Office are doing a review of the governance and, and effectiveness of, of that at the moment and, and observed earlier this week how the decisions were made around that. So it'll be interesting what they've got to say about the governance associated with. Are you happy with that, Sheila? Okay. Can Council I just add one yes, other point as well? Um, Claire's mentioned the reporting process. Each of those strategic partnerships will have to report progress against those priorities. The carers' partnership will report against those priorities. And when those reports go to the regional partnership board, I'm hoping that they're going to be in a certain way that uh, could be shared wider with PSB mm. colleagues or with uh, yourselves as well. So um, I've been linking in with the PSB and uh, Matt uh, Gatehouse here to ensure that there is a bit of consistency uh, through maybe the reporting and the look of these plans as well. So we might not have to wait for the annual report. If there's a need uh, to bring a report, whether it's a carers mm. or the people and children, we could even look to do that at an early opportunity. Okay, thank you. Councillor Thomas. <laughs> Thanks for that. I, I, I'm, I'm sort of uh, heartened by the uh, sort of lines of communication and, and accountability because I, I think that is so important and you can have the best policy mm. um, written and, and it, it, it looks marvellous. But what you want to see as well is, is what's happening on the ground. Mm. And, and most people in, in this room and most people in society now will have a, a parent or a relative uh, who's getting older, who, who's 
having to access these services mm. um, and, and it does concern me not in this authority but in another authority with, with an elderly relative of mine that sometimes you need to have a very strong sort of family advocate and, and people who are professionals it th- there's not a family connection there when whether it's with a child or whether it's with a dementia patient uh, and and sometimes policies are great but what actually happens on the ground and it it, mm. it does concern me um in terms of things like you, you hear the term multidisciplinary <laughs> approach, etc., but then something goes wrong, they say, well, there's been, been a breakdown of communications. Um, all of these lines have to work, and, and you can have the best policy out, but what you want to see is what's happening on the ground. Absolutely. And in reality, all of us in this room and in society, we might well be accessing these services at some point, so we won't be reading a glossy uh, document about it. You want to see, well, what does actually happen when um, a husband or a wife dies or a partner dies and the person's left on their own and, and they're becoming frail, etc. So I, I really think accountability is, is, a, is a huge issue and, and it needs to be spread, not just in this scrutiny committee, but across the council. Uh, because it, 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 it's such an important issue. Yeah. Claire? And uh, so accountability is, is a key theme here this morning, isn't it? The, the other thing to say is that I am statutorily, again, required to report to full council on an annual basis through my Director of Social Services annual report, which has to report on the effectiveness of those regional arrangements and the effectiveness on the ground of delivery, as well as... Um, a range of other things but but you know that's another reporting mechanism which needs to go to through full council is required to go through full council okay louise uh, yes uh thank you uh, chairman um i wanted to focus a bit more on the nitty-gritty of the details of the report so i was looking at page uh 20 and page 21 um which was to do with the approach to older people and obviously a preventative type of strategy where a priority is to improve emotional well-being for older people by reducing loneliness and social isolation with earlier intervention and community resilience. I mean, I think it then later goes on to talk about on page 21, care closer to home. Now, I'm assuming that care closer to home means keeping people in their home and providing a support package in relation to that. But unfortunately, it doesn't really take account of the sort of pathway that um, people might go with dementia because... Um, you know, the early stages, for example, uh, you know, support carers going in every so often and supporting them um, uh, coming in a co- either a couple of times a week or a couple of times a day is um, uh, a reality. But as, they, as their condition progresses, um, the people who are largely the family who end up looking after them um, then find that um, it gets to a point where they can no longer cope. And obviously there are occasions when people become violent as a result. I mean, I know um, you know people who've had dementia whose um, partner has been injured as a result of them wanting to leave the home and basically um, you know, injuring them to obviously a man and a woman carer and being injured as a result. And when I spoke to went along to um, Chepstow Hospital and there's a ward there, that uh, the Saint-Pierre ward, that I'm very concerned about the idea of inpatient care um, for dementias being taken from Chepstow because it means that effectively there will be no inpatient care at all in the east area of the health board. You've got inpatient care everywhere else and I think care closer to home not only means care actually in your home, but it also means closer to home so that the carers and the patients can get to local hospitals. And I think this is an important uh, you know, dimension to put less stress on carers as well. And I think this plan misses out the pathway of the way that um, dementia happens and how it gets worse and how the levels of care that you need might increase 
increasingly get greater either into a hospital or a care home. And I think that that misses, misses that important dimension because when things get to a crisis stage and when, um, you know, a, a, a partner is being violent, they maybe have to be admitted into hospital to be assessed to then consider, you know, should they have um, a different care package, should they um, be admitted to a care home or whatever. And I think this plan... Um, you know, doesn't really take account of that particular need. It does say um, on page 20, the percentage of unscheduled admissions of older people to hospital who are receiving care and support services. And I presume that means uh, a lesser degree. And even in relation to the uh, page 22, which talks about people li living with um, dementia um, and dementia uh, friends and the community network and so forth. All that is important um, and it helps in the early prevention stage. But as you've already painted a picture, it's going to be fairly patchy. You know, in some areas it might be shops that are trained, in other areas it will be this, that and the other. And there's nothing often it falls actually on the family to take care of the people and not necessarily getting enough respite care as a result. And I don't think that this plan deals with those practical issues on the pathways of, of, of dementia. Um, so, uh, you know, um, I, I think it's a step forward, but I don't think... I mean, people in the community aren't going to care full-time for somebody with dementia. It's generally their, their partner or family that the burden falls on. And I don't think this plan properly recognises that. Yeah, that, that's a good example. And another example for that, Councillor Brown, will be where, where the objectives of each authority have on, let's say, leading on dementia. So if you've got parents or whatever live in Newport, let's say, Generally, you'll find with rural locations, etc., like Monmouthshire, families don't live near or they live a long way away. Access to services is very awkward. But if you live in a city or a, a very large town, you actually have then facilities or you have people very near. It's like delivering me's on wheels. How long does it take to deliver to the elderly or people who need me's on wheels in Monmouthshire than it does in, let's say, Newport or Caerphilly, let's say, or certain areas? So, there are other aspects, but that's where we come along, isn't it, Claire, with our objectives. We're going to be totally, actually, what you've just said there, Councillor Brown, will be possibly one of the objectives we have to try and put together to put in a report, let's say, on, on a yearly finding. That, that we are, we, are, we have that problem. How do we address it? So, so we're actually probably answering our own questions here because we, we, we've, we've hit, hit a hurdle there, which we need to try and resolve as Monmouthshire. Newport's hurdle is going to be different, correct? Am I right? Yeah, yeah. Totally correct. Yeah. Right, Councillor Brown, yeah, do you want to answer that, yeah, Councillor Brown? Yeah, I, th I think it would be helpful if we hear back from the officers, if that's okay, Chair. Thank you. Um, I think it's um, some very, very good points, and it's recognising that this is a relatively high-level plan, and that I, when I talked about that there will be lots of supporting strategies, action plans, you know, critically pieces of work on the ground um, that deliver against those overarching objectives and, and measures. Um, that's, you know, where we need to see this plan, I suppose, in the hierarchy of everything which exists. So Phil will talk a little bit in a moment about the National Dementia Plan for Wales and the Dementia Board, which again is a Gwent-wide board, um, which he supports, and how we've developed our, a Gwent-wide dementia strategy to reflect that, which picks that up, you know, the key strategic action specifically around dementia, but then we come through to implementation in the Monmouthshire context, as um, the chair has already said, um, may require some different, and uh, as I said earlier, um, some differently nuanced actions from implementation of that plan um, in Newport, even though the objectives and the outcomes and the models of service should, should have a, a fair and very high degree of commonality around them. So, so Phil will talk a little bit more about, about that detail. Uh, yeah, thanks, Claire. And um, I just want to reassure you that, um, you know, the dementia pathway uh, is in place uh, in terms of the work that we're looking at and the dementia board, you know, where we have the nurse director uh, with the uh, sort of sitting down with the older um, older people's nurses as well as uh, uh, social care managers. Um, I guess if, 
really, you know, if we included every action in this area plan, in the same as this needs assessment, it wouldn't be a document, it'd be a filing cabinet, because it would just be f full of information. And uh, it's the same with this area plan. What we've tried to give is a, an appreciation of the types of action, but also um, what we probably need to make a little bit more clear is the signpost then to where the further information is held. And as Claire's mentioned, we've had the Welsh Government's launch of the new National Dementia Strategy, which is setting out some clear actions. And what we have in this region is a Dementia Board, chaired by the Nurse Director for the Health Board. And uh, around the table, like I said, we have Alzheimer's Society, Housing Associations, as well as clinical leads and, and social care managers. We have a regional approach for year in Gwent, and we have an action plan that we've been monitoring for the last few years, and that will um, you know, break down into things such as dementia friends, but also diagnosis rates, how we improve diagnosis rate. How about, uh, and also the, um, the early intervention and the support at the point of diagnosis. And I've spoken to many people living with dementia and they said once you've had that diagnosis it's like the world comes caving in etc and so there's a support service that we have with Alzheimer's Society at that point of diagnosis but for me ultimately it's also about that um, greater understanding of what dementia is uh, as well and you, you're totally right and as I mentioned in the PowerPoint the carers is the big thing for me because without carers, you, you know, they are very much keeping society afloat with their hard work and, and support that all of us take on in some capacity. You know, like you, as Councillor Thomas mentioned, we all know somebody, we all have that relative. Um, I, I'll just share with you a very quick example. There was a gentleman in a care home who was getting very violent and he was trying to escape at um, night and um, it took about two or three people to restrain him and put pull this person back into bed come on mr jones back to bed and uh, one night he tried to uh, sort of escape and again getting violent and um, they said to him what's what's happening why are you trying to escape he said i've got to milk the cows in his dementia he'd gone back to a time where he was still in work and uh, it was that understanding so because the um the care workers had that understanding they said, well, Mr. Jones, they, they, they thought on the spot. They said, um, it's OK, your son's been on the phone. He's going to milk the cows this morning. Oh, thank God for that. I'll go back to bed. So from that understanding, it gone from two or three people restraining this person and, and, pu and putting this person into bed to a simple bit of understanding, a quick comment, a little bit of a white lie, we know, but it's about the outcomes uh, for the person with the dementia. It's not about us, is it, really? So... That's the wider context, and that's, I think, everybody needs that sort of understanding. And, uh, you know, I've heard many similar stories to yourselves about people getting violent. And when we explain through Dementia Friends what happens with dementia, it's not just our memory loss and maybe, our, you know, there's certain parts of our brain which control our filters. You know, we've all had that expression. Oh, 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 good job I didn't say what I thought then. <laughs> but, you know, with some people, you know, oh, oh I don't know, actually. But, yeah. But, you know, some people have filters. The examples of, of ladies who've, who've never swore, who've started swearing. And, and the, the, the really powerful one for me was a, of an old lady living with dementia and got to a point where she started speaking Welsh. And, and the family couldn't believe this. They said, well, why is she speaking Welsh? She'd gone to night lessons. No, she'd been in hospital. But she'd regressed to a time in her childhood and she went to Welsh medium school. Uh, you know, so it's that understanding, uh, I think, is why that... And, and not sort of belittling the experiences of people who have, who have been attacked violently by loved ones and partners. But I'm just saying that needs to happen as well as the, the great understanding and support at that point of diagnosis. Okay. Right. I've got Councillor Fowler, Mike Fowler, sorry. And Louise, you want to come back in on what? Yeah. On. Okay, yeah, no problem. Mm. Um, yeah, I think uh, what I would have liked to have seen then is just at, le at least a sentence or two within the plan saying that we will be um, uh, looking in, you know, other reports or dementia boards or anything like that to say that when uh, we recognise that, um, you know, inpatient care may be needed when when the early intervention doesn't work and it reaches the crisis point. I mean, I would have liked to have seen that. And I do recognise the point that you make about calming people down in terms of getting into their 
reality, you know, and, and I've had experience of that in relation to, um, you know, relatives, in-laws of my own, how um, calming the situation down um, works by getting into their reality like they think they're going to go to work in the middle of the night and you have to say, oh, it's all right, it's night time, go back to bed, as opposed to saying to them, um, uh, you're not in work, you retired years ago, you know, that sort of thing. And, and that's a fairly simple thing. And that's the sort of thing that, you know, uh, I suppose, I don't know whether carers or anybody else gets training in that sort of approach, but, you know, that does help. But I do think there needs to be a recognition that, um, you know, care close to home and getting the community to help is not the be-all and end-all. And we need to recognise that people will reach that crisis point where they need inpatient care. And I'm interested in seeing that in, and that it, the, that care is close to home. And in particular, I'm concerned that the eastern area of the um, health board isn't providing any inpatient care um, or is suggesting closing the ward that's got inpatient care at Chepstow. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for that. Mike? Hi. Um, can I go back up to the higher level again? Um, so I'm looking at the five authorities involved. They're obviously quite diverse in their needs and makeup. Um, and then financially, there's a great variance in our budget and some of our neighbours' budgets. So my, co my two core questions is, can Monmouthshire does it have the resource to pull its weight in this big plan? And secondly, can we afford financially what the plan commits us to? I, th I think very, very interesting questions in the context of you know budget, which has been approved by by council earlier this week, and um, the. I suppose gap really, um, which the Health Foundation report, which I know was referred to by one of the members in, in that council meeting, um, has projected between social care funding um, and the projected growth over uh, the next period of time in what's going to be needed in adult social care, particularly to, to meet, meet the needs and demands um, across the piece. And in terms of Monmouthshire position and, and social care services, I think we have um, been relatively protected by the council in terms of meeting the needs of our population, in terms of um, recognising the pressures that there are, particularly around workforce, coming coming back to, to that point again, um, and the need to invest in a quality workforce, um, not just within the council, but, but out there. Um, but we are limited in terms of the resources that are available to us, which is why a lot of the, the strategies and plans um, and a lot of the work in Monmouthshire for many, many years has been based on, you know, supporting people to, to live the lives they want to live, working with them to do what matters to them, which sounds great words, but what that means in reality is that often um, that will mean less formal support than traditional social care um, and health services um, brought with it. So give very practical examples um, around that, um, talking about somebody needing domiciliary care, um, you know, previously under sort of um, social services where we worked to a unified assessment approach, that whole assessment was about what people couldn't do, not what they could do. And often you would find that resulted in four calls a day of domiciliary care. Now focusing on what people can do, they may well still need some domiciliary care input. It may well be far less than four calls a day because their other needs, their social needs, and we talked a little bit earlier about loneliness and social isolation, are being met by connecting them to community, um, making sure they're attending sort of groups and, and interests they feel better, happier, more fulfilled, and the social care input um, is less than it otherwise would have been. It is incredibly tight. When we look at our, our demographics, um, it, is, it is really, really difficult um, uh, going forward to see how much longer our approach, um, and I think other authorities would say this as well, they have different challenges to us. Um, we have the challenge, particularly around the demographics and the costs of rurality in providing services. Other authorities, when you look at the health needs and the um, early mortality rates in some of our um, neighbouring authorities um, bring with it huge challenges in themselves. So I think, think we're all really struggling in terms of um, meeting that need and demand. But the models and the way of doing that, we have a mantra 
do the right thing um, and it is also more cost effective the savings have come have seen us through so far i also need to to mention um, the challenges in terms of children's services across the region we're all facing um, significant overspends on our children's social services um, largely as a consequence of not being able to meet need and demand for those most complex children um, locally within that in the Gwent region and that's why those priorities which Phil highlighted earlier um, around children out of county placements trying to develop alternative models within Gwent far better outcomes for the children closer to home more cost effective as, as, as well. Okay I think that answered your question yet yeah. and that answered your question Roger as well early on didn't it actually about the financial side of this. Just one second Louise can I just take you back then to the financial side of this then the Welsh Government are asking us to deliver all these things or we're trying to deliver all these things is it going to come to a point where I think it was made made public today a lot of English authorities now are actually dipping heavily into their reserves to deliver these models um, and deliver care within their communities, especially elderly care, etc. Have we come to the point now where if it continues like this, we're going to have to have a different view on uh, the financial side of uh, how this is all going to be delivered, especially care and uh, young people's needs and children, etc. What is the thoughts on that? So thoughts, um, Phil, Put on the slides that the graph of doom um, again I think this authority this council um, has resisted the urge um, and what some authorities have done which is to disinvest in those earlier intervention preventative services services such as our community hubs um, and our libraries and our museums etc but has remodeled them um, to be effective in meeting needs which mean people then aren't coming um, to our front doors of social services earlier than they need to. And, and that whole approach needs to continue to be the case, however difficult it is when you're faced with these great um, statutory demands. Um, if we take away those safety nets, in a sense, the, the people who will be coming to the front doors of, of, of social services will increase, and I think then we will be in a very, very difficult position. I think from a finance point of view, what Welsh Government have started to... to channel some investment to delivery of these priorities. I mentioned integrated care fund earlier. It's a drop in the ocean really against our whole budgets as a region, but that's 9.2 million at the moment across Gwent, which allows us to do some of the transformati transformative stuff, which is delivering against this plan. There's also been an announcement of 100 million to deliver on the parliamentary review of health and social care. Um, but we don't know any detail yet about how that is going to come through to us and, and what's going to be required um, uh, in terms of transformative work against that. But again, it's in that transformative space. So we'll hopefully be a helpful resource to us in terms of shifting models of care and, and getting better outcomes. Yeah, and we're doing a large piece of work on, on care within the authority as well, which hopefully in the next probably few months we'll be able to bring to full council to agree that. Yes, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Louise? Yes, thank you, Chairman. I just wanted to clarify, obviously, um, with regard to Chepstow Dementia Ward, no decisions being made by the Health Board yet. And I do really hope they maintain inpatient uh, care um, within the within this area. Um, the, but looking at um, dementia. Um, friendly communities and so forth. I mean, that's obviously part of the plan. Are there um, resources for that available? Because obviously you can get um, churches or voluntary organisations who want to do something about social isolation in their community, you know, having coffee mornings or various other activities, uh, lunch and clubs and so forth. But, it, you know, where is the um, actual funding going to be for, for doing this sort of thing? On a on a Gwent, either on an individual authority basis or a Gwent, Gwent wide basis. <clears throat> if I come in there, uh, in terms of the um, new na national strategy, um, a budget or an, a, an allocation of funding has been uh, highlighted. But uh, similar to clear, you know, with the parliamentary review and the comment just made, we don't know what that looks like yet and, and how much it is. But, uh, it, you know, your comment you've made was made by um, Assembly members when this went through. Um, yes, it's all very well, a good action plan, but how are we going to deliver this? And I think uh, that's one of the reasons that uh, uh, this strategy took so long, going from the consultation phase 
ways to their publication because there was some real concern that uh, th th there was lack of funding. That said, you know, you know, we wouldn't use money as an excuse either, and we have to get on with some of this as well. Um, you know, we've worked with businesses such as Tesco's and um, Morrison's and uh, Waitrose, for instance, in Abergavenny. And, you know, should we, um, you know, should they pay or should we be charging them, et cetera, for delivering some of this training, et cetera? Well, actually, you know, it's in their benefit to be dementia aware. Their businesses will benefit as well. So a lot of this we have been sort of doing as a sort of a mutual partnership as well. Um, so it gets us so far. It doesn't get us all, all the way over the line. But, uh, you know, we... What I wouldn't want to see is an over-reliance on funding, which is going to say, well, we can't, we stop doing this. I think with this plan and we, you know, again, Claire's mentioned the graph of doom, you know, we have to be innovative, we have to be creative and, and to look at low-cost solutions. And a very quick one in terms of the dementia support, similar to the lady who talked about losing her eyesight, I spoke to a person living with dementia and she said the biggest thing that happened to me in my life and helped me to deal with my dementia is actually chatting to another person who's just had a diagnosis. Uh, this was a lady who wouldn't leave her house until 2 o'clock, wouldn't get out of bed until 2 o'clock in the afternoon because that's when her husband came home from work. She was so embarrassed that she had this di di um, diagnosis of dementia. And she'd gone from that position where she's now catching a bus and she's actually addressing and speaking to people about her own dementia in larger audiences than this. And she said... I was able to speak to this person and she was able to sort of understand what I'm going through. And she also said to me, yes, come on, we need to get, you know, it is challenges, but you need to sort of make the most, get, you know, of your life, etc. And it's easy for me to say that. But when you've got another person with dementia who's been diagnosed two years previously saying that, um, how much does it cost to do that? You know, it's pennies. And we've started a new service in the Gwent region where at that point of diagnosis, anybody can speak to another person who's had another diagnosis to help support that. And, and that's, a new, that's a new project. It's in Gwent only. Gwent Alzheimer's Society has set that up. Uh, and again, that's trying to be innovative and creative as well. Okay, thanks. Any more questions? Sheila. Thank you, Chair. Can I just make a point um, about something you've just said? I recently went to a meeting and there was a presentation from a nurse who seconded um, to one of the cancer charities. And they uh, have, um, they go out and they give presentations about forward planning and thinking ahead. Now, it, it's a little step, but it's a very important step. But it's been able to point people in the right direction. And, you know, we were delighted to have this presentation. We learned a lot from it, but that's the sort of thing that's happening, and it's very good to know about, and, and it's just a case of scooping up all this information and pointing people in the right direction sometimes, isn't it? Yeah, very good point, Sheila. I, I've just asked a question there. What is the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's? Which, and I think out there, it's actually getting people to know, take it to the forefront, and put it, put it, put it there, because it is really difficult. If somebody's yeah. had a stroke who loses the memory and can't remember what they're doing. They're all little strands from this, and I, I find. It. Could I ask who is our champion? Do we have a dementia Alzheimer's champion within Monmouth County Council? Um, previously, it was Jeff Burrows, and I used to work very. Um, so okay. yeah, of course well, it is. This Councillor Jones, and jo Councillor Jones has actually been along with myself and the the dementia champion for Torvine to present um, Melon Holmes <laughs> with a uh, dementia friendly award. Be uh, sorry, care and repair because of the fact it causes yeah. both boundaries. But the question you asked, difference between Alzheimer's and dementia, um, I, I should say wait until the next presentation because that's the second key message. Okay. However, but, but I will. I mean, basically, dementia is the, the term, uh, is the condition. Yeah. Alzheimer's disease causes dementia, and 70% of people living with dementia have Alzheimer's disease. So dementia is the umbrella term. Alzheimer's disease causes dementia. Yeah, okay, that's lovely. I th and there are other things out there as well, other illnesses as well, aren't there, which we probably don't even touch on, which are, are touching on Alzheimer's or dementia as well, aren't they? Which, so, so there are lots of things out there. And Mike? I, um, I'm, I'm guessing you've kind of um, presented this plan far and wide already to several groups. Um, I just wonder if there's any headlines or common themes that each group are bringing up that we haven't considered, um, or if there's any issues that we ought to be aware of that, that have been raised 
under od other audiences. You put me on the spot. I took this to um, Kefili Full Council on Tuesday, and uh, I think some, to be honest, similar points. A lot of um, people, councillors, were talking about the resources to deliver some of this, which you have uh, have raised um, the, the sort of care closer to home again massively. You, you know, um, transport is, is another big issue, uh, but. Um, I think there's a not so much a concern, but there's a real emphasis on actually getting on with some of this now. We need to turn these words into action, and you know the stuff we're talking about, we, we may have been talking about for uh, years and years, and uh, and I think that's some of this comes through f from yourselves and, and other groups as well. Coach Thomas Tudor. You've touched on it, but I think one of the big sort of uh, issues you know, nationally is the uh, sort of lack of profile of working in, in a care situation. And, and that stems very much from the payment. It, it, it's, it's not very well paid, but also in, in terms of um, the profile. And, and I think that's very important. It, 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 it's, a, it's a growing area. And I do think that puts off probably young and talented people from going into that area because it's it's badly paid, uh, antisocial hours, but as well um, the lack of of sort of public esteem in in some ways, as opposed to say straightforward you know working in a hospital, being a nurse or a, or a doctor, and and the other thing is you know Mark Drakeford was on on TV last night talking about in the future having to have in effect a tax for care. You know, to, to, to fund it because at, at the heart of it that that is the problem um if, if you're going to have a decent um, care system whether it's children or older people or people with particular needs then somebody's going to have and it's got to pay for it and, and you look at that profile of, of people sort of 64 65 the post-war baby bulge people they are going to live longer um they will undoubtedly become frailer and and will need greater help so Two things that really is this a national sort of thought about professional uh, enhancement and and also obviously long term pay you know how are we going to fund it? Yeah, I mean, I mean certainly in terms of the workforce issues, um, we have a national body for social care workforce, social care Wales. Um, and we are working with them and through the regional work to look at national campaigns and national career pathways um, for care. If you were to ask me what my top three priorities were, are as Director of Social Services, the care workforce would be certainly up there in, in, in the top three. Um, because exactly as you said, we need to make care a career of choice. We need to support people in terms of the training pathways through um, we need to make sure the image of the care um, sector is positive as you say as the, the health sector um, is and that there's pride and value in that um, and that we properly resource it and a lot of the work that we've already done with care at home Monmouthshire what started as the Raglan project for the in-house service is that work that now you've heard some about through the adult select committee turning the world upside down and that will come back back through because it's to make sure in our Monmouthshire context that the care work force um, is valued in the way that it needs to be financially the budget supports uh, that's just been agreed by council supports the investment in that workforce um, through national living wage but we also then need to look at which is the turn in the work um, work how we commission services so that providers are in a position to move their workforce onto salaried positions rather than the task and time type um, contractual arrangements which have been the key feature of that that care sector in terms of paying for care gosh this has been a political one that's been going around um, for a very long time isn't it and and it's still in that very difficult box um, that I think you know politicians of every color of every administration haven't you know properly responded to things like the, the Dill Not Review, which came through. It's interesting to hear the interview last night. You know, we need to see the detail that, that comes through. We've got policies, obviously, in Wales around domiciliary care cap, um, which is a different position for, from England, which is currently at £70. We've got that reducing threshold around residential care um, in terms of when you become responsible for paying for your whole, but a whole scale look at, at funding care going forward alongside the NHS. Hopefully, as one of the themes that will come through the response from Welsh Government to the parliamentary review as well. Okay, thank you for that. Right, can I ask one last question? If nobody, anybody else? Louise, I hope it's not about Chepstow. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. No. 
<laughs> no, it's, it's to do with the, um, uh, you know, coming back to this dementia friendly, you, get, you gave the example of, uh, um, you know, a, a supermarket being being able to train people, which is very good, you know, because they've got a, a captive workforce and so forth. So that's easier. But mobilizing people actually in the community, it's still takes people to actually go out and say you know how do you help reduce socialization uh, social isolation you know and what do you do about it and um you know there are resource implications in terms of the time of person a person going out even to explain that and then you've also got the issue of that um you know say for example there's luncheon clubs or or coffee mornings or whatever you know that that place in a village hall or wherever it might be you know still needs um um, heating, lighting, room hire, and so forth. So even if the costs aren't necessarily that great, there needs to be sort of like this seed type of funding available, which, um, you, know, you know, is is something that really does need to be looked at if you want to expand it any further than um, just sort of captivated audiences. Totally agree. A good will can only get us so far. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing what uh, funding does come forward with the new strategy so couldn't agree more okay maureen did you want to speak Just, yeah quickly. i was going to say we want to have a snowfall every so often because in our estate particularly and way around all the people have turned around and they've made sure that those who are uh, housebound whether it's through dementia or anything else that they've been looked after they've got milk and everything like that and I think if we can enlarge because it's very difficult it's lovely to have a coffee morning somewhere as, as, as Louise says but a lot of these people can't we'd have difficulty getting there and I think if we can only get the the old-fashioned community feeling whether it's in in the country or in in, in the towns or anywhere um, and people just look out for somebody, and I think that's something we want to try and encourage, and that doesn't really cost a lot, just time, yeah. I think more in, as a nation and as, as human beings, I think we actually pull all the stops out when we have to do. Um, I do worry about the generations below us. They're busy with families. They're really busy. They're working. They've got families, busy, busy lives. Eventually, it, it, they'll get older like us, and, and, and you do realise. So I, hopefully, but as a nation, as a country, I think we do pull the stop. So, right, I've got one last question. It does revolve around scrutiny. We have the uh, wellbeing plan, the four objectives from Monmouth County Council. You've put eight objectives up there within this plan that we, we, we will be uh, looking to measure and score and... and, and, and focus on how do they cross cut with them four objectives also because I think the critic not criticism wrong word but we as a scrutiny within Monmouthshire we don't want to go around in circles by doing one section I CYP and adults and all the other we need to be focused on what challenges that we need to give to officers to make sure that we're delivering the well-being plan this plan scrutinizing the board also yeah. and and there's a lot of work there and there's a lot which we as members have to focus on how do we measure then that the cross-cutting side of this cross cuts with the four objections we have within the well-being plan how, how will that come about um, will that be up to officers to highlight or uh, because some of us will sit on the board, uh, the scrutiny committee, which scrutinises the board. Some of us won't. Some of us will be scrutinising other things in other selects. And I just don't. I, I want to know: is there a framework here that actually we'd have a have to have a different direction how we scrutinise this? Do we actually sit three times a year or four times a year as a select committee and focus on them eight objectives? Let's say. I just want a, a bigger picture here for the long term how we do that because I don't think I don't think actually we went through council on Tuesday. Yes, I think it's coming on board, same as the four objectives will the well being plan are gonna come on board with us, understanding. But I think long term for us the scrutiny we need to have some direction and quite quickly as well, because you're asking us to do something and ask we're asking you to start it as well. 
I just like some direction. What are the other authorities thinking about in doing that as well? Um, um, the question has been answered, reference to this is ours, mm -hmm. so we won't get involved with the others. Mm -hmm. That be on a regional level or on a board level, etc. Any thoughts on that? If, if I could come in there. Uh, at the back of the uh, area plan under Appendix 1, yeah. there was a, a, a mapping exercise um, I sort of produced, and that was mapping out those eight core theme priorities yeah. against the five wellbeing plans. Yeah. And, and you, you, you are correct. It will fall predominantly to officers. I myself and um, myself and Matt at Gatos sit on a, a, a Gwent wide group, it's G Swag. Is it, is it? <laughs> no, the best. Goes back to that acronyms, okay? Uh, Gwent Strategic uh, Wellbeing Assessment Group. But basically, it's the five PSB leads and myself but we also sit on there with the Police Crime Commissioner, with the Public Health Wales and Natural Resource Wales. And th the whole emphasis of that group is for that very reason, to make sure that these priorities are cross-cut in. And uh, th th the first place we start is to avoid duplication. And I, you know, I'm, I had to go along and speak to all the People's Commissioner representative yesterday because there was um, a lack of dementia actually recognised within one of the wellbeing plans. But we had to say, well, actually, it's because because we've committed to doing it regionally. So, you know, that's examples of where we try to work uh, and, and that will continue and that's a weekly. And, and for me, I would have loved to be in a position where we could have had the same action plan template used across both pieces of legislation. And, and just a reminder as well, ideally there would have been one wellbeing act they wouldn't have been the future gens and the social services yeah, of well-being. Yeah, yeah. uh, they both got well-being in the title for a start. You know, I think so that's a. They both got the same uh, direction of what yes. they want to achieve. Yes, uh, uh, but that is the legislation that we are manoeuvring in. But in terms of scrutiny going forward, I think at the very least it would be looking at the annual reporting process at least yeah. once a year. But then what you may, what I would like to be in a position to do is that when, for instance, you are discussing children, young people's agenda maybe or the best start in life which it is here in Monmouthshire uh, best possible start in life that you know if there's any accompanying reports that have been produced coming from the Children and Families Board they could ac accompany that as an appendix in the same way that when you had the full report in council the well-being the, the area plan was an appendices support and information uh, and I think if we get used to doing that, you will then arrive at the best um, solution for you as scrutiny. You may find actually we need to put more scrutiny sessions on, or you may actually find actually if this comes in as a company report when we're scrutinising the wellbeing plan, that would be sufficient for us. Okay. Hey. Could I just then say, when we would discuss the uh, equality impact assessments on reports, etc., and any reports coming to us, are we going to find any of this then attached to it where mm. they will be uh, the eight objectives will there be something in there to say that actually there is a criticism of this let's mm. say not criticism but there's of the report yeah. is there'll be objectives as it considered as, yeah, as yeah. it considered yeah. i.e young people within with uh, is that going to happen do you ask First time it's been raised, I think that's a really good suggestion, yeah. I, I, you know, we've all got the standard committee reports where you see reference to, you know, the wellbeing objectives being considered. So, yes, uh, it's a good question. I'm going to take that back and expand on that. Yep. Okay. Thank you for that. Members, are we happy to move forward? Any recommendations that we feel that we need to take forward from this? Are you happy with the report, uh, with the, let me get this right now, the words right, um, with the chief officer bringing back a report per annum to full council, because there was that discussion we had prior. Are you happy with that, or do you want to actually just test the waters? On? It's up to you. I, I'm, I'm Louise, Roger. Yeah. Louise? Louise? First. Do you want me to... Yeah, no, yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah, uh, Thank you, Chairman. Um, I think uh, I would like it to come back to scrutiny before it goes back, before it goes to council, because, uh, you know, we do need to have a look at it first so those comments can be taken on board. OK, Roger? Only to say uh, I'm sure Claire will bring anything to us that um, is either going really well or really need some uh, uh, looking into and uh, I you know I, I okay. know you'll do that so You're that's all, all that matters with that then yeah? yeah okay well done Hazel just two seconds and I'll close this one down then
my point's kind of gone now, Chair, but basically (laughs) what I was just saying off the back of your comments was Mm. would Phil like to say a little bit about what he sees is the role for scrutiny members in terms of going forward? Because we've had a chat about it before the meeting in terms of the on overseeing the ongoing delivery of a, an action plan. But one of the points that Councillor Howarth made about it, it's it's not picked up all the time, but it's about scrutiny members having that sort of um, overview of all the council strategies and, and documents that come through the scrutiny process and ensuring that there is alignment to this because quite often things come to us and it's for members to try and find um, a sort of alignment with some of the corporate plan and, and all the other documents and certainly with the um, the evaluations that the chair mentioned we're shortly going to be undertaking some training for members on equalities and one of the things we're going to be asking the trainer to specifically look at is to try and help members to identify through looking at those assessments some of the implications particularly for future generations so it, it, it's going to be quite a a specific role that I see coming forward for scrutiny members so I don't know if you've got any other views Phil as to what specifically members will in a scrutiny process will be looking to do in terms of carrying this forward because I know there was some discussion in our pre-meeting and there were some concerns from our members as to what their future scrutiny role would be. It, yes, very good question, actually, and uh, it's it kind of put me on the spot, but uh, no, I'm thankful for that, actually, Hazer, because it's the first time I've been to scrutiny where this offer has been made, and I, I do really appreciate that. I mean, delivering the air plan is going to be difficult, and, and in a lot of cases, and Claire will testify to this, some of this regional working is on top of the day job, and, uh, you know, there's a huge amount of um, work that's got to be taken forward. So... By scrutiny, um, helping us to deliver the plan, helping us to evaluate progress, it's keeping it at the forefront, it's keeping it on the radar of um, the sort of public sector working. I'll be honest with you, and I know Matt Gatehouse has left now, but I sometimes feel that the area plan is overlooked in comparison to the wellbeing plan. And uh, I, I think that actually is, is a bit of a mistake, but it does feel like that in some cases. Not so much here with Matt. Matt and I have an excellent relationship, but when, you know, I know other authorities, other regions feel that uh, that's... So where you can keep this on the radar and to keep pressing this agenda for us and to keep it visible, I think that would be the single most um, biggest help to us. And you can and you can only keep it visible by us coming continually engaging, bringing those reports, and all the comments have been useful. Uh, you, you know, I know we get quite a few questions, but this population needs assessment. Didn't look this way until I took it through the scrutiny processes and full council. So every comment I get, I'm scribbling away. It gives me an opportunity to make the document a better, better, more stronger document. Okay. Oh, exactly. That's that's the easiest task I can take could, away. Could, yeah? I, could I say then from today then, could I just put one recommendation if you'd be happy as a select? That every piece of paper that we produce for reports or for council or for anything, that actually this is highlighted on that report, the eight objectives of the wellbeing plan and of this plan. Because it actually keeps it at the forefront. We know what the three main objectives of this council are, don't we? I.e. CYP... Um, your department, Claire, and the enterprise. But do we actually think about this now when we walk out of here in another three months' time, let's say? If you have a report and it's on there uh, of an object of the objective plan or, or the, eight, the eight there, it's nothing to put them on. It's just a cut and paste thing, isn't it, for, for officers? Could, could I say that actually we keep it at the forefront? Yeah? We'll be happy to put that as a recommendation? Okay. Can we move that one? All right, thank you. Right, I'm going to close the meeting now. I'll give everybody a comfort break while the officers set up for dementia training. Um, And um, thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you.